On the 28th of May, 1914, the Empress of Ireland departed Quebec City with plenty of waves and some tearful goodbyes. The air was filled with excitement and adventure, but less than 12 hours later, the ship would find itself lying at the bottom of the St. Lawrence River, and over 1,000 people who had just said farewell to family and friends would lose their lives. On today's episode of Never Stop Learning, we will be taking a look at the sinking of the Empress of Ireland. The Empress of Ireland was a Scottish-built ocean liner launched in 1906. At a length of 570 feet, the ship could accommodate a total of 1,642 passengers, as well as a crew of 373. The heart of the ship consisted of its two coal-burning steam engines that could bring the Empress up to a speed of 18 knots. This allowed the ship to cross the Atlantic in just six days. Over the next eight years, the Empress of Ireland completed the 2,800 mile crossing between Liverpool and Quebec City 95 times, transporting over 180,000 passengers between England and Canada. At half past four in the afternoon on Thursday, May 28th, 1914, the Empress departed Quebec City on what would be its final voyage, bound for Liverpool. The captain of the ship was newly appointed Lieutenant Henry George Kendall, a rising star in the nautical world. Captain Kendall had received reports of patches of heavy fog in the lower St. Lawrence River. Having experienced these conditions before, he took the usual precautions of reducing speed, but remained unalarmed. On deck, the crowds no longer able to see the docks of Quebec City, slowly began trickling down to their cabins to arrange their belongings and familiarize themselves with their new surroundings. With the sun dipping below the horizon, passengers began making their way to the main dining saloon to enjoy their first meal aboard the Empress. As the evening went on, Captain Kendall stopped the ship at Romowski, a town on the New Brunswick shore about 180 miles northeast of Quebec City, and the final load of mail was brought on board. At this point, the ever-widening St. Lawrence River is leading into an inland sea that is roughly 30 miles wide. As midnight approached, the weather grew extremely cold. The temperature was sitting just above the freezing point. Almost all passengers had retired to their quarters, other than a few enjoying a late night poker game in the smoking room. The cold air had a piercing sting, making any time on deck of the ship anything but pleasurable. Before we get into the final moments of the Empress of Ireland, Make sure to like and subscribe to see everything else this channel has to offer. At half past 1 a.m., the Empress reached Father Point, where the river pilot disembarked. These pilots are used while traversing the St. Lawrence River due to how difficult it can be for large ships to navigate the narrow passage. Once he was dropped off, Kendall resumed course and sighted the Norwegian freighter the Storstad approximately two miles away. At the same time, he noticed a slight fog bank drifting slowly off the mainland, blanketing the river. As the ships headed towards each other, the fog thickened and the lights of the Storstad disappeared. Captain Kendall ordered a full stop of his ship and blew the ship's whistle to indicate so, as this was the only way Kendall could communicate to the oncoming ship in the fog. The Storstad replied with a long whistle to indicate acknowledgement. From the bridge of the Empress, the crew strained their eyes in an attempt to see anything through this thick mist. After about two minutes, the red and green lights of the Storstad materialized about one ship's length away from the Empress on a collision course with its starboard side. Captain Kendall snapped into action immediately 
He took out his megaphone and attempted to shout to Captain Anderson on the Storstad to go full reverse, and at the same time, he ordered his crew to put the Empress to full speed ahead. It was at this point that the lives of 1,477 souls aboard the Empress would be forever changed by the next 15 minutes. Had there been time, hundreds who went down with the ship would have survived. Over 1,000 men and women who had been resting peacefully in their bunks awoke too late to scramble above deck. They were crushed by the bow of the Storstad or overwhelmed by the icy waters. The lights went out within minutes and everyone began fighting for their lives in pitch blackness. It is impossible to tell everyone's story, so we will focus on five individuals who experienced the hellish nightmare that was to follow. Henry George Kendall, Captain. As the Storstad pierced the starboard side of the Empress, Captain Kendall shouted to all within earshot, the ship is gone. He ordered the crew immediately to begin filling the lifeboats. This was when the engine stopped and the list to starboard grew steeper. Kendall headed back to the bridge where he saw the chief officer rushing along the deck. He ordered him to get an SOS signal out, which the officer replied it had already been done. It was at this point that the ship turned over and Captain Kendall was thrown up the bridge into the icy waters. He managed to clutch onto some floating debris before getting picked up by one of the lifeboats. He then took command of the lifeboat and managed to pick up another 20 or 30 survivors into the boat with others attached to the side in the water with ropes around their waists. After his lifeboat was filled beyond capacity, they set out for the Storstad to drop off the survivors. Once they returned to the scene of the wreck, they shouted out looking for any more survivors, but they were met by silence as there was no one left alive. Dr. James Grant, ship's surgeon. I was in my cabin and heard nothing until the boat listed so badly that I tumbled out of my bunk and rolled under it. I concluded that something had gone wrong and tried to turn on the light, but there was no power. I tried to find the door bolt, but the list was so strong that it took me considerable time to open the door. When I reached the alley, it was so steep due to the way the ship was tilted that my efforts to climb up were rendered impossible. I then managed to scramble up and get my head through a porthole but I was unable to get my shoulders through. At this time, the ship was almost flat in the water on her starboard side, and a passenger who was standing on the plated side of the ship finally managed to pull me through the porthole. About 100 passengers were standing on the side of the ship at the time. A moment after I joined them, the ship took another list and plunged to the bottom. I next found myself in the water and swam towards the lights of the store stop. When nearly exhausted by the struggle and the exposure, I was picked up by a lifeboat and taken to the store stop. Then we were heated and wrapped in blankets and I was provided clothes that enabled me to do what I could to help the other survivors. John Fowler, Steerage Passenger I actually saw the Storstad approaching the Empress. When it struck, it did not seem to be that severe. I just felt it and had no idea the result had been so serious. The water began to come into our porthole and it reached above my shoulder before I could shut it. By that time, the ship was healing over so badly that it was difficult to get out. I heard the sirens blowing a great deal I tried to quiet the people when I got out by telling them that it was all right and that the boat would right itself. I saw a lady with two children, a small baby and a little girl of six, and I put a life belt on them both. 
I took them on deck in a kind of panic. We lost each other, and I don't know if any of them were saved. And if I had not had strength, I could not have gotten away. I climbed up to the second saloon deck and went along there and saw Miss Wilmot struggle to get up the steps. She could not do so as the ship was listing so badly, and there was a lot of water in the passage into which she fell back. The ship was so much to one side that you could walk on her walls as if it were the floor. Alice Bales, Second Class Passenger I thought we had struck an iceberg when I heard the fearful grinding in the bows. With a cry to the girls who were with me, I stumbled out of the narrow stateroom and groped up to the deck. There was chaos. The ship was listing, listing, listing. Every step I took to the uppermost part of the deck, I seemed to be slipping back into the maelstrom of water and falling bodies. Finally, I gained the rail. I climbed up on it, and with a prayer in my heart, I jumped into the blackness. The water surged over my head. Down, down I went. I could not swim a stroke, but I remembered that you should keep the air in your lungs, and as I sank, I clenched my jaws, determined to stay with the battle as long as strength lasted. After long, long periods of struggle and fainting and renewed struggle, I saw a man not far off swimming with a life belt. I forgot to tell you that I fastened a belt around my waist when I jumped. I reached my hands towards this hope of rescue, the man's belt. It eluded me. Finally, I grasped it. Then I saw how the man made swimming motions like a frog. I tried to do the same. I used every fiber and nerve to make the motions. I knew this was the chance for life. Then, when my energy was going fast, I heard a faint cry. There was a cluster of people. It was a lifeboat. The next few moments are indistinct in my memory. Someone was lifting me, dragging me over something hard. Now they were speaking to me. They revived me and got me aboard the Storstad. The ship that struck us, I can't tell you any more. Lionel Kent. I was in cabin 41, which was aft of the promenade deck, and my traveling companion was Mr. Goslin. He woke me about an hour after I had retired and told me there had been a collision. I did not feel it at all. I went on deck at once in my night attire and my bathrobe. When the boat commenced to slide over and I looked for a life preserver, but found that someone had taken every one of them from the promenade deck. So I went back to my cabin and took a life preserver from the top of the wardrobe. I saw the two boats just drifting apart. At that time there were no lights on deck and very few people were about, but they soon began to appear. I remained on the port side of the boat as the list continued until the starboard side was underwater. Then I jumped into the water with many other people and was picked up ten minutes later by one of the lifeboats. Those in her numbered about 30 were mostly members of the crew with four or five women. The boats on the port side of the liner could not be launched because owing to the list of the ship, they swung inward on the davits instead of out over the sea. The only boats that could be launched were on the starboard side. I think a good many people were injured by the sliding of the port lifeboat when they released. They slid along the deck to the starboard side, crushing many people against the railings. The next morning, 465 people from the Empress had survived the night, while 1,012 had lost their lives. After an extensive investigation, the crew of the Storstad were found to be at fault for the accident and were required to pay $2 million in damages. It is still the worst peacetime naval disaster in Canadian history, but it was overshadowed in the news as exactly one month later, events in Europe sparked the beginning of World War I, causing the sinking of the Empress to drift from people's thoughts and settle in the back pages of history books. Thanks for watching this episode of Never Stop Learning. Give us a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. All the information for this video, including eyewitness accounts, 
was collected from The Tragic Story of the Empress of Ireland. Until next time.